Good morning. Good to see you today. It's good to be back with you today. I am excited about this opportunity. I am grateful, as Michael shared with us, about um, my mother and the mother of my children. I will leave quickly after the 11 o'clock service. On the way home, I will call my 88-year-old mother. She'd still whip me if she, she knew some of the things that I do, I guess. Um, but I, she's the best mother in the world. I'm very grateful for her. And then also, um, this afternoon, I'm going to sit and hold the hand of mother of my children for a while. I'm very grateful, very grateful for her. God bless all of you. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 14. God has laid it on my heart for quite a while now to preach through the book of Hebrews for a lot of reasons. Very grateful for that and very grateful for His clear, clear direction. Would you stand as I read this portion of Scripture to you? Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the power of or by the word of His power, after making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to Him a Father, and He shall be to me a Son." And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain they will all wear out like a garment like a robe you will roll them up like a garment they will be changed but you are the same and your years will have no end and to which of the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You may be seated. The book of Hebrews is one of God's incredible gifts to us. First, let me share some background information about the book of Hebrews. Uh, The authorship is anonymous. It simply does not tell us who the author is. No one knows for sure. Some of the most prominent guesses are the Apostle Paul, Luke, and Apollos. Uh, The reference to Timothy laid in the book seems to point to Paul, but uh, scholars who know the Greek far better than I do say that uh, the construction and the vocabulary is not like Paul's letters. So best we can do is simply say the writer or God's servant who gave us this book. This servant knew much about the Old Testament and the Jewish sacrificial system. Best of all, this writer loved his readers. He loved the church of the Lord Jesus. And he wanted them to 
follow and serve and obey the Lord Jesus. His readers were Jewish believers primarily. Most of them second generation believers who lived somewhere away from Jerusalem. Probably in the 60s. Not the 1960s. The other 60s back then. Prior to A.D. 70, the 60s were a turbulent, difficult time for the church. Believers were under pressure and persecution from the culture in general, but the Romans always persecuted the church. But these believers were also under pressure and persecution from Jewish followers, from the Jews, many of them again Jewish heritage folks who had followed Jesus. Now they were under pressure. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 34 tell us much about the context. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. It refers to hard struggle. To sufferings, being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, some imprisonment and the confiscation or plundering of property. These are things that go on every day across our world against believers like us. Some of these readers were considering abandoning the faith, going back to Judaism. To avoid the persecution, the cross and following the cross brought scorn and persecution. They were contemplating moving back from the gospel to religious ritual and religious works to avoid the persecution. Chapter 2 verse 1 gives us some insight into the setting. Here the writer wrote this, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. These readers were struggling. They were undergoing hard times. What kind of hard times are you having? Sometimes... Believers undergo things that most of us don't see or know. We need to understand that the very nature of following Jesus is difficult. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Following Jesus always has been difficult. It always will be. And it is in the present. We must recognize that fact. Other things cause hard times. You're in an interim period between pastors. I'm in my 21st interim pastor. It's not my first rodeo. I've seen a few things. Interim pastorates are all, or interim periods for a church are always difficult. It's hard. It's a struggle. It's difficult. What do we do? How do we respond to it? Our world, our culture is headed in the wrong direction at breakneck speed. How do we respond? If we don't watch out, it'll run over us. How do we handle it? What do we do? You know the leak that happened this week before the official uh, 
response to the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health uh, case before the Supreme Court, before it was supposed to have come out in uh, the summer, improperly leaked this week. But what I expect, what many are predicting, are a ve- is a very raucous summer after, as all that happens. How are you going to handle it? What are you going to do? How do we respond to the difficulties and the pressures of being a follower of Jesus? This book of Hebrews is a call. It's a call for struggling, persecuted followers of Jesus to endure and to persevere. Now, <clears throat> those words endure and persevere <clears throat> are not fun words, are they? But they're necessary words. Because much of the theme of Scripture is a call to endure, to persevere. But here, to do that based on who Jesus is and what He's done. Hebrews is a call for struggling, persecuted followers of Jesus to endure and to persevere by understanding more about Jesus, His atonement. More about faith. More about obedience. Some themes throughout this book are Jesus, atonement, faith, obedience, endurance, perseverance. But Hebrews is not just a call to these things. It gives us reasons. Reasons to endure and to persevere rather than backing away from following Jesus when times are difficult. In this first section, verses 1 through 14, the writer of Hebrews called the readers to reconsider Jesus and the superiority of Jesus. It's interesting what the writer does. Understanding the themes of the book, understanding his purpose in the book, where he starts. Where does he start? He starts with Jesus. Simply pointing us to reconsider, to refocus, to understand who Jesus is and what he did and allow that to drive us and to compel us to continuing to follow and obey Jesus. To refocus on Jesus, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to focus on Him, the author and finisher of our faith, He will write to us later. So we are to follow and we are to refocus on Him. Jesus Christ is worthy of our following and obeying in spite of the difficulties and struggles of following Him. A theme throughout this book is the worthiness of Jesus. What do we do in tough times? We refocus, stay focused on Jesus. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. Here we have a summary of Jesus. These verses 1 through 3, 1 through 4 are some of the most amazing verses of Scripture. They give us an amazing description of Jesus. The writer is simply here at the beginning of this book saying, Look, here. Focus on Jesus. He gives a summary of the existence, the life, the nature, the work of Jesus. First, he points us to, the, to God's early work. Now, you figured out by now, it doesn't take a lot to excite me, but two words here excite me. Long ago. Think about those two words. Folks, God didn't start His work for you yesterday. God has been at work for your life and for your church since long ago. Paul would tell us since eternity, 
God has been at work for your life, for your church. But here the writer's emphasis is long ago through the prophets, all through the history of the Old Testament. What was God doing? God was at work for you, preparing and pointing us toward His great work in Jesus. But then the writer moves on and he says, But now in the last days. You realize that? You're in the last days. The last days as he, as he, as he describes are from Jesus' first coming until His second coming. We live in those last days. And what has God done in the last days? He's spoken to us not through the prophets, but how? Through His Son. That makes us special. God has placed us at a strategic time in history. And now He's spoken to us through His Son to do His work for us, in us, and through us. Then in this passage, the writer gives a description of Jesus that is just amazing. First, he refers to him as his son, God's son. This passage, this book, points us to the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is the God-man. He is, the, is God who became flesh, pointing clearly to his divinity. It describes him as the heir of all things. Being an heir was important in Jewish and Roman culture. Jesus, the heir of God, the heir of all things. God giving Jesus ownership and authority over all things. I'm reminded here of Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth is given Unto me. I remind you today that Jesus owns you and all that you are and all that you have. And folks, that's a good thing. Jesus, authority over us because he's the heir of all things from the Lord. This passage points to him as the creator. The creator from Genesis 1.1, Hebrews 1.10 says, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Colossians 1.16, there Paul described Jesus as the agent of creation under the Lord God. He created you. You're His. What's he going to do with you in tough times? Can he handle it? Yes, he can. He created you. He's going to take care of you. This passage also points to the nature of Jesus. Two very powerful phrases here. That he is, Jesus is, the radiance of the glory of God. All the glory of God, all of His majesty, all of who God is, all of His holiness, all of His righteousness, all of that which makes God good, all of that which makes God powerful, all of that which makes God glorious is in Jesus. The radiance of the glory of God. And then there's the phrase, the exact imprint of His nature. The exact imprint of the nature of God is in Jesus. Colossians 1.15, Paul wrote that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When Jesus looked into a mirror, who did He see? He saw God. God in all of His glory. This passage also points us to the sustainer, that Jesus is the sustainer of the universe. Paul would refer to the same idea in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. It amazes me 
amazes me. Not only did the Lord God, Jesus as his agent in creation, create vast galaxy upon galaxy, universe upon universe, but he controls them all. He manages them all. He keeps them in line. Can he handle my little problems? Can he handle my tough times? I believe he can. He is the sustainer of the universe. But then this writer moves to that which is the central part of of who Jesus is and of history itself, he uses the phrase, after making purification for sins. Throughout the book, he uses the Old Testament and uh, Old Testament sacrificial system to help explain the atonement, the work of Jesus on the cross. Here he simply summarizes it by making purification for sins. I remind you today that the Jesus who is God, who became flesh, the perfect, sinless Son of God, went to a Roman cross at the hand of the Jews, but yet... Put there because of my sins and your sins. And there on that cross, God placed on Him our sins. God placed on Him the penalty for our sins. God placed on Him the wrath for our sins. And Jesus provided reconciliation, justification, all those wonderful biblical words. But here the writer says he made purification for our sins. He purified us. He cleansed us of our sins. Is that person worth our following? Yes, he is. He made purification for my sins the filthy sinner that I am that I was God has purified my sins taken them away washed them away with the blood of the Lord Jesus but then this passage says that Jesus was exalted After making purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's there today ruling and reigning and will be forever. This passage in verse 4 makes an interesting reference. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, that's an interesting phrase. The name he has inherited. What name is it talking about? Well, Jesus is a wonderful name. But I don't think that's what he's pointing to. I think we have to look back to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. There Paul wrote that because of Jesus' obedience, even under the death of the cross, that God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name to which every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, curios. A little bit of study there shows you that that word curios, Lord, strategic, important word throughout the New Testament. But when the Septuagint, a Greek translation from the Hebrew Old Testament, was written a couple of hundred years prior to Jesus, the scholars were looking for a Greek word to translate the name that God 
revealed about himself to Moses in Exodus 3. Yahweh. Four little Hebrew letters. That became the most important name about God in the, in the Old Testament. It was so revered they'd hardly even say it. They had to find a word. What word did they settle on? The Greek word kurios. So when Paul wrote Jesus, the name has, has been given the name that's above every name, which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is curious. I think he's pointing Jesus Christ is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. The name that he inherited, the greatest name there is, to which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So he's crucified and exalted. Again, these are amazing verses of Scripture, an amazing description of Jesus. It's all about Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just as the, the writer of Hebrews here began with Jesus, we must focus on Jesus. He must be the focus of all we do. These facts here about Jesus should carry us forward. They should drive us. They should help us. When we endure hard times, when things are difficult, when things aren't the way we want them to be, these truths ought to compel us Help us, encourage us, move forward. If these things are true, do not falter, do not drift, do not quit, but endure, persevere, keep going, keep on fighting the fight, running the race. In John chapter 6, there's an episode with Jesus and his disciples that reads this way after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him they didn't like some of the hard sayings that Jesus was giving them and they left they got out so Jesus said to the twelve do you want to go away as well Simon Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the holy one of God Peter was saying Jesus where else would we go to, to whom would we turn you're it Jesus we're going to stick with you. We're going to stay with you because of who you are. I believe that's a lot of what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Look at this Jesus. Look at what he's done for you. Look what he, 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 who he is and what he's going to do. Stick with him. Keep going. Endure persevere through whatever the cost because Jesus is worthy but now to verses 4 through 14 in this section the writer points to the superior superiority of Jesus over angels you have this section, 4 through 14, where the writer points the superiority of Jesus over angels. In chapter 3, uh, he points the superiority of Jesus over Moses, pointing to the law and the Old Testament system of sacrifices and rituals. In both cases, he's trying to redirect their attention. Probably these folks had an excess, excessive interest in angels. They sure had an excessive interest in the Old Testament. So some of them grew out of the, came out of Judaism. Some of them considering to, to go back. What's his point? Jesus is superior to every religious system. He is superior to every bit of man's pursuits, the world's pursuits, even angels who are from God. 
Jesus is superior to all that man can dream of and think of to try to help us. Pointing us to Jesus. But what does 4 through 14 communicate to us about Jesus? Well, what the writer is doing here, he, he brings up a lot of Old Testament quotes. And again, throwing this back and forth between the Old Testament and the present, showing the superiority of Jesus over angels. Pointing to this idea of the superiority of Jesus. In verse 4, he simply makes the affirmation that Jesus is superior. In verse 4, His name is superior. Again, pointing to this idea of the inherited name from God. Again, Yahweh, the name to which every knee should bow and every tongue confess. In in verse 5, again, He's called my son. In the latter part of verse 5, He's called David's offspring. Again, God didn't start this yesterday. He's been at work since Genesis 3 to bring forth a seed, to bring forth a redeemer, to bring forth someone to help us. And He worked and brought us Jesus through or as an offspring of David. In verse 6, He points us to the fact of Jesus being worthy of, of all worship. Uh, The idea of firstborn often misunderstood here. It doesn't mean that Jesus was born first. No, Jesus is eternal. The word firstborn here is often through Scripture points to the most important as it was in their culture. Scripture says, let all God's angels worship Him. Not vice versa. If angels are to worship Him, what should we do? Verse 7 gives a description of angels. Important, but yet inferior to Jesus. In verse 8, He points us to Jesus being an eternal ruler. His throne will last forever and ever. Do you catch that? Your throne, O God, pointing to Jesus, is forever and ever. We often say, yeah, God's in control. God's still on His throne. Do we really believe that when times are difficult? He is. He will reign. He will rule forever and ever. Yes, He can handle our problems. He can handle our struggles. What do we do? We look to Him. We trust Him. We abide in Him. Verses 8b and 9 point to Jesus being a righteous ruler. He has the scepter of uprightness. He loved righteousness. He hated wickedness. And because of this, God has anointed him above and beyond his companions. Verse 10 describes him again as creator. He laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the very work of his hands. Can he handle my little problems? Yes, he can. He is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Verses 11 and 12 describe Jesus as eternal forever. He is from eternity to eternity, no end. He points here, compares that to His creation. They, the creation, will perish, but you remain. 2 Peter 3 describes for us that God will bring all creation to its end in His timing, in His way. He will destroy the earth by fire and create a new heaven and new earth. He says, like a robe, like a garment. He says, you will roll them up. But you, your years, will have no end. 
I can trust somebody like that. In verse 13 points us to the idea of Jesus being victorious. This phrase to make enemies a footstool is, a, is an idiom that points to victory. Victory over all of our enemies. In this world we have many opponents that Satan himself the world opposes us. But our God will have victory. I love a phrase in one of the songs we sung. I love a lot of them. But one especially. You have the last word. Do you believe Jesus will have the last word? Yes. <laughs> I can trust, I can follow somebody like that who has the last word. Verse 14 simply points us to the role of angels, not for worship. Psalm 8 says that God has created man a little lower than the angels. But here, there are servants to serve and minister to us, quite a contrast, quite a, a paradox in Scripture we have that uh, one of those that are, is difficult to understand. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We're to look to Him and honor Him because of His superiority. Uh, the writer here is simply emphasizing the superiority of Jesus over everything, even something as exalted as the angels. Jesus is worthy of our worship, worthy of following, worthy of staying with Him even in difficult times. Again, what are your hard times? Again, you may be going some, through something personally that nobody else here knows. Part of your struggle may be the, the typical struggle of uh, what churches go through during that interim period. Some of your struggles may be the pressures of doing church and serving the Lord. Some of them may be the pressures of our culture and, and how all that uh, weighs down and points down upon us. Part of your struggles may simply be the cost of following Jesus, following Him well. What is the writer of Hebrews trying to tell us? No matter the cost, no matter how difficult it is, when we understand who Jesus is, what He's done for us, and what He's going to do in the future for us, then there's no reason, no need for drifting. No drifting away, no quitting, no going back, no slacking up, no coasting along. But what do we do? We endure, we persevere because of who Jesus is, what He's done, and what He's doing, and what He will do. I'm reminded here of the old hymn that says, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. My friends, Jesus, whatever you're going through, whatever our needs are, Jesus will meet our needs. Today, there are some of you who need to start following Jesus for the first time. The Emmanuel staff and I would love to have some conversation with you to help you with turning your life, repenting of sin, and turning in your life to trust this Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. See us after the... The service today, Pastor Michael and I will be here at the front. If you want to start those, that conversation with us, even now during this last song, come to starting point next week, May 15. Start that conversation soon with somebody about you following Jesus. 
But many of you today, you've already made that initial start with Jesus. But the question is, what are you going to do as the hard times come? If Jesus is who He says He is, what do we do? We continue. We endure. We persevere. If you need prayer about that, need to talk about that, we'd love to have that conversation with you as well. A part of what that means is for you to dig in. Don't just coast along, but dig in. Dig in to what this church has to offer. Dig in to abiding and following and obeying Jesus through the Word and through prayer. We'd love to help you with that. Again, starting place would be a good starting place for that. Keep on, keeping on, running the race with Jesus. Let's bow together. Father God, help us today. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks. Father, thank you for Jesus. The one who's done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Help us and lead us as we seek to follow and obey you. No matter the cost. No matter the difficulty and trials that go with it. In Jesus name. Amen.